Uh, John, in your review of Stephen Knotts's volume called Rush to Judgment in the latest Claremont Review of Books, uh, you write the following. Uh, Presidents have exercised something like the prerogative, the ability to act in the silence of or even contrary to written law throughout American history. Let's talk a little bit about... uh, Okay, that was really great. (laughs) I love that. Well, it was only one sentence. It was downhill from there, you understand. Uh, uh, But, uh, you know, prerogative uh, is, of course, a term from John Locke Mm -hmm. and from British political practice long before John Locke and after John Locke. Um, But it's not a word that's actually used in the Constitution. Um, Nor are there, I think, many American presidents who ever invoke it or appeal to it as such. Even the Federalist Papers talks more of the president's prerogatives as opposed to uh, the kingly prerogative power that they seem to be moving away from. So Mm. why is this notion of uh, prerogative so central Mm. to your histories and Mm. your understanding of the executive power? Do you, Mm. are you overestimating it in in Um, the American uh, experience? Well, actually I think of it more as a prerogative as a shorthand for a a fundamental problem in Mm. government design that it really goes to Machiavelli, I think, as uh, Harvey Mansfield showed in Taming the Prince, this problem of what do you do when something arises that you could not anticipate, right? mm-hmm. that you could not prepare for with a, a law, that you could write out, anticipate all the circumstances, and these things will happen. What is the power of the government mm-hmm. to respond? Emergencies immediately, of one kind or another. Yes. Yeah. New circumstances, emergencies, surprises. You know, War is really the ultimate form of a lot of these challenges. It's, just, it's not a uh, power, really, per se, that needs to be given to the Constitution. It's just that every form of government has to be able to handle that. And it was really Machiavelli who said, right, the best way to deal with that is that you have to have some unitary actor, one person who can act suddenly. Yes. That legislatures are too big to respond quickly to things like that, just by design. They're, they prize deliberation, not action. And the executive is in some ways the reverse. Right. And so the Constitution, it's not that it gives the prerogative power, but it handles the problem of the prerogative in different ways. The way I think of it is that uh, the executive power that's vested in the president by Article Two was understood by the time of the framing to encapsulate this emergency response power. Right? Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. you think the 9-11, you know, nine, not, not the 9-11, it is 9-11, but the 911 call, as right. it were, at the national level is answered, you know, the president is the one who answers the call. It's not going to be answered by Congress. It's a, it's a fundamental problem. Like Jefferson and Lincoln, I think, were the two presidents I, who really yeah. wrestled with it with different answers. I mean, it's a problem because for Machiavelli, all of all political power is prerogative power. Yeah, wait, right. I mean, there's never a non-emergency situation, yes. basically, or never a situation that you can't turn into an emergency if, if you were good an, at if it. you're an aggrandi- <laughs> right. aggrandizing right. Um, prince right. but the the problem for constitutional government has always been how to acknowledge the problem as you say while at the same time maintaining the rule of law yes. you know a role for the legislature a role for the courts yeah. um, limited government while at the same time recognizing that there's a certain uh, drop of the poison of unlimited government, which is which is healthy. Too much of it, however, would be fatal. Yeah, so I think this is the interesting thing about uh, Harvey Mansfield's book is that he kind of ends the story right when it gets interesting, where he kind of he's like kind of ambivalent about what the Constitution does in response to this problem. Yes, that's his word. Yeah. In fact, yeah. the ambivalence of uh-huh. executive power. Yeah. You know, the CRB is so good, you go beyond the title of the book to look at the subtitle <laughs> to see what the title really should have been yes. if you weren't trying to sell a lot of copies. It's so well, it's, we have, there are a lot of people out there who are interested in, in you know, these important topics, uh, John. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> you know, so the problem was, it seems to me, is that Jefferson thought to solve your dilemma. Mm-hmm. I think you really describe it well, was to say, wow... Well, he didn't say wow, but <laughs> Jefferson was said, it's impossible. It's not recorded that he said wow. <laughs> you know, Jefferson, uh, his answer was, uh, you really couldn't harmonize the two. You mm-hmm. could not actually write down a preset system of rules for a government and then also anticipate the future. So what he did with the Louisiana Purchase, I was really amazed when I was writing this uh, Crisis and Command book that Jefferson just said, Louisiana Purchase is unconstitutional. I don't think the government can buy land 
that's going to be a state right. without amending the Constitution. But then he did it, and he said, it's the prerogative that caused me to do it. Because like in every American, Jefferson could not turn, out, turn down a good sale. Yes, right. right. It was well, such a good deal, he well, had to buy it. And location, location, <laughs> right, location. Right, right. I mean, yeah. Although you're talking about the Louisiana, Louisiana Purchase doesn't come around uh, <laughs> right. you know, every year. Well, I was thinking that's not the best neighborhood to buy but, a house. But, but, the but, other, the rest but of the Jefferson is, is unlike Lincoln, right? I mean, uh, and for your argument, yeah. is Jefferson more inconvenient? Because yes. it was his position that he did have to act outside of the Constitution. Right. But then he sought legislative popular approval uh, right subsequent uh, a subsequent forgiveness from the legislature or the people uh, Lincoln's the one who actually I think answers the question differently and in a way that has become kind of the consensus okay we'll talk about that so, a little so Lincoln, bit yeah. he you know as, as a great writer of course uh, really uh, the, the way he wrote is beautiful and he really expressed the problem in lots of ways are still vivid to the mind like you know do I have to destroy the nation and save the Constitution right um, don't you have to amputate a limb to save the body? Sure. He always had these, you know, homespun analogies to it. So he always raised the issue of the prerogative, and he was very conscious of it. But when you look at things that go back to what we were talking about earlier, the Emancipation Proclamation, mm -hmm. right? Where does the president have the power to free the slaves? Lincoln did not say, as Je Jefferson might have, this is such a necessity, I have to be able to do it to save the Union, to free the slaves, even though the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court in Dred Scott, mm -hmm. slavery is constitutional. Instead, he says it's part of the executive power to successfully conduct the war. It's almost mandatory. Yes. <laughs> According to Dred Scott. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He's, he's acting against Supreme Court opinion about the right. Constitution at the time. But what Lincoln did is he said, but it's still part of the Constitution, it's still part of the executive power. It's part of the commander-in-chief power. So it's part of the ability to win the war. And the reason I think this is important and different than Jefferson is that Lincoln finds a place in the Constitution for it, but if you think about it, it's really not domestic. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. These kind of emergencies, these ruptures or uh, crises are not going to happen domestically as much as they happen in foreign affairs. Lincoln cabins it by finding a place for it in the commander-in-chief power. Right. But he too goes, I mean, subsequently, the, he looks to Congress or to popular elections as a, as a kind of check or... Um, even sort of second, a second uh, voice in in the executive prerogative, not in the actual use of it, but in the judgment of it subsequently. Wouldn't you say that? Yeah. Well, it's definitely true. The outbreak of the Civil War, where he takes a lot of measures yes. that are just flatly unconstitutional, raising an army, paying their salaries, way beyond the laws. Yeah. Right. No one even argues that those are there's some interpretive argument that would make those constitutional. You go the. Free of the slaves, the Emancipation Proclamation is interesting. That's never really subjected to popular approval until the 13th Amendment right, to the Constitution. Right. But he doesn't go to Congress for ratification of it by legislation the same way he yeah. did with a lot because of his actions a, in the Because that's beginning. a commander-in-chief yeah. military necessity. Yes, yeah, so yeah, and that was actually, yeah. he was very conscious of the idea that he did not want Congress coming in and sort of dictating to him how to fight the war. Right. They had a large say in the start of it and the funding and the payment of it. But there's a, another part of the book I talk about, the big fight over Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Lincoln had very little intention of letting Congress get involved yes. in running the reincorporation of states into the Union. And presumably Reconstruction would have been much different if yes. he had lived. Yes, in fact, it probably would have been a lot shorter and swifter.